all for joining us. Um, we are really grateful here at the Department of Neurosurgery at Lenox Hill Hospital um, to be hosting this webinar in honor of Brain Aneurysm Awareness Month. Uh, my name is Hannah Flam. I'm a project manager here, and I've been working um, with our Chief of Neuroendovascular Sur Surgery, Dr. Yafel Sarule, along with his NP, Yewan Lee, and our amazing superstar supervisor of administrative coordinators or support coordinators, Catherine Plim uh, Morgan, I almost use your, your <laughs> other name, um, Catherine Morgan, she's amazing. Um, and we're all here to um, help share information about brain aneurysms. And um, Katie's actually gonna be sharing um, a story about how she discovered she had a brain aneurysm. Um, and then we're gonna open up the webinar to questions. So um, at the end for the Q&A, please post your questions, not in the chat, but the Q&A box. That way we're going to be able to see, um, see which questions are coming in and then we can like track them and see, um, like answer them as we go along, keep track of your questions. So again, please use the Q&A box for those questions. And I'm going to stop talking and <laughs> pass off the mic to our first speaker today, Dr. Yafel Sarule. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who's here in this webinar. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. Um, so I'm Jafel Cerulli. I, I lead the neuroendovascular program here at Lenox Hill Hospital. <clears throat> we have a very active aneurysm program here, aneurysm practice, um, which we will talk about today. So we will try to keep it very informal. And if you have any questions at any time, whether it's me, whether it's Yewan, or whether it's Katie speaking, just feel free to put it on the Q and A um, chat, and then you know we will be answering questions as we go along. So just to start it off, you know it's Brain Aneurysm Month Awareness Month. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I like to always start by saying is that brain aneurysms are more frequent than what we think they are. They occur in about one in 50 people. So if you take about 100 people in, you know, in, in a certain block in Manhattan, if, you're, if you happen to be walking around the city, you know, two of those people, of those 100 people, are going to have a brain aneurysm. Unfortunately, you know, aneurysms are a silent threat. We don't know that we have them until um, it's too late in many cases. Um, and when I say it's too late, it's because one way how they present is when they unfortunately rupture. And if they rupture, you know, patients then are, you know, suffering what we call a subarachnoid hemorrhage, in which case they are wheeled to the emergency room and we have to take them, take care of them in a very acute setting, which is usually not great. Now, the other way how we, you know, encounter them in clinical practice is when we find them incidentally, meaning a patient had a headache or had some dizziness or had some other symptoms. And then for those reasons, they get an MRI or a CT scan. And, you know, in that CT scan or MRI, we happen to find, you know, the aneurysm, which in a certain way is the best case scenario because that way allows us to to, to look carefully at the aneurysm and plan ahead for any potential treatment if needed. So here at Lenox Hill, we're, we're very proud of the aneurysm program we have built. Um, if I can think of some uniqueness to it, we are very, we, first of all, we manage everything as a team and we are very subspecialized, meaning we have attending physicians who are specialized in every single aspect of aneurysm care and we manage every patient as a team so that when you come to see me or see one of my partners, you're really seeing the whole team together. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about, you know, aneurysms. Um, um, we're gonna have Katie talk a, a little bit about her own experience. So Katie works with us. She's a supervisor here in our department. Um, I've known her for over five years now and she she has an aneurysm herself, and she went through the whole process of being a patient with us. So she will talk about her experience, and then we have Ye Wan as well, 
who's my amazing superstar nurse practitioner who manages um, a big part of our practice. And, you know, she sees aneurysm patients on a weekly basis. So why don't I pass along a little bit to you, you want to, you can introduce yourself, talk a little bit about what we do on a daily and weekly basis in our clinic. And then maybe Katie can talk a little bit about her experience being a patient. But, you know, the interesting thing about Katie is not only being a patient, but also she became a patient after working for many years with aneurysm doctors. So she's she's seen aneurysm disease basically from both sides, from both the, the 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 team taking care of the patient and then from being the patient herself and then after that of course any questions that you have um you know we will we will answer and before you want give me one more second i see a question in the chat is an mri better than an mri mra or pet scan to find an aneurysm i had many mris but nothing showed up until i had an mra that's a great question and, you know, the answer to that, MRA is much better than an MRI to look at an aneurysm. In a general MRI, you can look at the brain tissue, but you do not look at the blood vessels. Only an MRA can look at the blood vessels. So if you had an MRI and was negative for any finding, it doesn't mean that you do not have an aneurysm you need an MRA or a dedicated vascular imaging study to find out if you had an aneurysm. So great question, and you want, I'll pass it to you right now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Yuan Lee. I am an acute care nurse practitioner. Um, I work with Dr. Cerule, and we take care of a myriad of um, uh, of patient populations, um, specifically uh, related to vascular. So anything dealing with the brain vessels, we see. Um, specifically regarding to aneurysms, basically it's like instead of your blood vessels, you know, in the brain being nice and straight, they for one reason or another kind of get weakened and then, and then they balloon out. And um, that weakening is, is what we're trying to keep an eye on and trying to monitor over time. How it's diagnosed is, um, it's a perfect segue ac actually from the question that we received is we uh, most often get an MR angiogram, so an MRA. So it's a specific type of MRI. Um, and that's actually a common question we get in the clinic is, you know, I have, I've had a bunch of MRIs. Why do I specifically need an MRA? Again, like to echo what Dr. Cerule said is, uh, with an MRA, we get a specific um, look into the, the vessels of the brain versus just the tissue itself. So we either get an MRA or we get something called a CTA. Um, it's another type of um, imaging into the brain vessels. Uh, and that's with a, it's like another variant of a CAT scan, basically. So we do it either way. And then once we get better imaging, um, either with a CTA or MRA, Dr. Cyril and I kind of look and um, review those imaging and say, hey, is this is this truly suspicious for aneurysm? If it is, you know, depending on the size, location, shape, family history, whether you have family history of um, aneurysms or not, is this warrant like a further look? If the answer is yes, then um, what Dr. Cerule does is something called a cerebral angiogram, a diagnostic cerebral angiogram. So not to be confused with MR angiogram, but cerebral angiogram is basically when he takes like a super thin wire like thinner than like the tip of this pen. It's like super, super thin. Goes in through the, either the wrist or through the groin and then shoots up dye. So it's kind of like a, an intense version um, of a 2D imaging. We get 3D kind of, um, I guess almost like a 3D model of what your brain vessel looks like. So we, Dr. Surly does the angiogram and then we get a better idea of, hey, is this, aneurysm, what we think it is. Is it truly an aneurysm? Is it just an outpouching, an infundibulum? Um, and then that helps us either, you know, one, get a good idea of what the image or the aneurysm actually looks like. And then number two, you know, if we were to decide to proceed with treatment, it gives us that kind of like a baseline and it, it provides kind of like a map or a guide for Dr. Cerule if you were to treat it in the future. So those are kind of the ways that we diagnose an, um, aneurysms. Now, 
Um, I can, I'll give us a brief kind of intro on the different types of treatments. And then obviously, since Dr. Sorley does this, the procedures, um, he can kind of expound upon them. But um, one of the ways that we treat aneurysms, again, aneurysms are balloons or outpouching. So if, if blood were to continuously flow into that balloon, there's a chance of rupture, which is what we had referred to earlier with the subarachnoid hemorrhage. How do we prevent more blood from getting into the outpouching or the, the, the balloon wall? We either, we can put coils in the balloon and make sure no blood gets in there, or we can put something called a stent, a flow diverter stent at the base of the aneurysm. And that prevents the, the blood from going into the, the balloon and just kind of keeps it basically diverting the flow back into the brain vessel. Or we can do something called a clipping, which we clip the aneurysm at its base. Um, those are the three types of um, treatments that we uh, offer um, most often. The coils and the stents can be done endovascularly, meaning those can be done within the brain uh, vessel itself. We don't have to open up your skull. Again, we go in through the groin or through the wrist and um, treat your aneurysm that way. So it's more minimally invasive. Now there is an option. We have several neurosurgeons within a practice who do the more um, open type of treatment where um, there's a small kind of opening made into the skull and the surgeon will clip the aneurysm out of his face and it's like a more definitive way of completely treating the aneurysm. So those are the kind of um, treatments that we offer. Sometimes we do a combination of the two. It really depends on who has the aneurysm, what it looks like again, where it is, the family history and such. So yeah, that's kind of what we do here. That's great, Yuan. Thank you so much. Um, I there are a few questions that I'm before giving it to Katie in the panel. I'm gonna try to to tackle. There's a question asking if a patient had a repaired distal abdominal aneurysm and later, incidentally, a couple of very small brain aneurysms were found out. What are the probabilities that other aneurysms are present and where in the body are they usually found? That's a great question. I think that the answer, the short answer will be yes. You know, when you have aneurysms elsewhere in the body, that means that, you know, you're fundamentally um, having a problem with your vessel wall. As Yuan was, ex was explaining, vessels are like tubes and they are surrounded by, by a wall and that wall, when it becomes weak, for many reasons that I can explain uh, in a second, then that's when the, the ballooning starts to happen. Why does it become weak? Well, many factors. A lot of it is genetic. So it's, it's just, just to ask yourself, you know, oh, why is certain things run in families? There's a lot of genetic component to it. Uh, so there's a big genetic component to it, but there's also you know, some other risk factors that are associated with it, like smoking, heavy alcohol use, high blood pressure, and, and so on. But, you know, as I said, even in those cases, when, when, when you're trying to have a normal, healthy life, you can still encounter that. So family is a big thing. So where else in the body would they be found? Well, look, you know, usually the aorta in, in, in the chest would be a culprit, the kidneys um, as well. Uh, arteries in the kidneys, but really everywhere in the body. Usually the most dangerous aneurysms are going to be those in, in the brain, those in the aorta, and, and the ones that are kind of in the more peripheral organs are not really as dangerous. And in terms of the best imaging, MRA versus CTA, to follow up, well, they're both good. I like to use MRA because it does not involve any radiation. So if we're gonna, if, if we know you have an aneurysm and your aneurysm is very small that we think we just need to follow it every year, the best way to follow it would be with an MRA because you're gonna have this study done for many years and we can save you from having radiation. Sometimes the CTA is better. It gives us more details, but again, if it's for follow-up, I think MRA is better. And, and to then, chime in with that, um, with yeah. the CTAs, uh, actually quite a few of our patients have um, presented um, with histories of uh, IV contrast allergy, in which case, if we can't do IV contrast, then GAD is fine, which is what um, the imaging solution that we use for MRA. So if I know a patient has an IV contrast allergy, I just go for MRA without hesitation. Right. 
Um, that's great, exactly. And then just if, uh, there's another question in regards to angiogram, cerebral angiogram. Is it risky? Is it a test or a treatment? Great question. So, look, angiograms are basically the workhorse of our practice in the sense that, unfortunately, with the imaging technology, with the best imaging technology that we could get nowadays, we don't get to the details that we need to make treatment determinations. So that's why we, most times that we see an aneurysm of a certain size, we need an angiogram. Are they risky? Well, the risks of an angiogram are pretty low. We tend to say that, you know, maybe one in a thousand patients can get some sort of travel from an angiogram, but those problems could be as minimal as a small hematoma in, in the area of the puncture or, you know, allergic reaction to the contrast. I mean, in other words, yes, there are some risks, as there are some risks when you get, you know, when you cross the street as well, that something happens to you. In the best case scenario, you don't need an angiogram, but if you need it, rest assured that it's a very safe procedure that we do multiple times a day, and that, you know, 999 out of 1,000 patients are going to come and get it, go home the same day, and we'll have a lot of answers to important questions. So um, that's that in terms of the angiogram, and then we can continue with the questions in a bit, but maybe we give now the mic to our own Katie Morgan. We'll be talking a little bit about, you know, her patient experience and her experience on both ends of the disease. So Katie, take over. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so I'm Katie Morgan. I am the supervisor for admin support here um, with the Department of Neurosurgery. Been here for 10 years. Um, spent many a years working alongside Dr. Langer, scheduling all of our new patients to come in, dealing with many aneurysm patients. Um, and it wasn't until uh, December of 2022 where I got to experience aneurysms from a whole different angle. Um, I received a call from my brother one evening that my mother was found in a parking lot and was on her way to the hospital. Um, you know, me being me in neurosurgery never would have thought an aneurysm. I thought, okay, maybe she fell and there was a subdural. Um, you know, we can we can handle that. That's, you know, exactly what it was and or what I was hoping it was. Um, and I remember, you know, driving to the hospital and calling our team here and, you know, asking them like, can you find out, you know, what's going on with my mom? Can you look at images? Um, and I remember being about 10 minutes away from the hospital, receiving a call um, from one of the doctors. And the first words were, were I am so sorry this happened. Um, did you know your mom had an aneurysm? And that was news to me. Um, I was like, I had no idea. My mom was relatively a healthy person. Um, I mean, you know, she'd walk miles a day and ate salads every day for lunch and never once complained about it. Um, so this was definitely shocking. Um, and, you know, we prayed for the best. I kind of knew the outcomes. Um, you know, I had seen some of the images of her MRIs, so I knew it wasn't good. Um, I knew, you know, there was the chance of survival was very unlikely. Um, but, you know, I prayed and did the best that we could. Um, unfortunately, she did pass. And after she passed, I came here and Dr. Langer looked at me and was like, you know, your family really needs to be screened. Um, it, it's possible it's genetic. Um, so I rallied all my siblings. I have, you know, I'm one of five, so I got everyone's insurance and started the authorizations and made all the appointments and the first three came back and they were all clear. And, you know, I was sitting there and I'm like, okay, we're good. We, we got this. Um, and then my, one of my older brothers went, um, and his test results, I remember came back and 
it was like, there's no aneurysm there. And Dr. Langer looked at it. He goes, nope, there's, there's an aneurysm there. It's not in the report, but it's there. Um, and so he looked at me and he goes, well, your chances just went up to 20%. And I remember thinking, great, now I have to go get into the MRA and um, be thinking that the chances I have an aneurysm are that much higher. And did my MRA, felt great, you know, didn't see anything that I was worried about. You know, you hear all those stories of like, the phone calls are instantly made when they see an aneurysm or they see something on your scan. So I got back to the office. There was no phone calls. I was like, okay, I must be good. I called my brother, started scheduling him for his pre-op um, testing and, you know, walking him through the process when Dr. Langer had called me and was like, by the way, you have an aneurysm too. Um, I need you to come in, you know, I, I treated me like a regular patient. I need you to come into the office, you and your brother we need to sit down and we need to discuss uh, surgical treatment for both of you. Um, both of our aneurysms were on the larger side. Um, we were both at six millimeters, both on the left side of our head, which is just strange um, that we both had them on the left side, but um, where they were were different. Mine was near my ophthalmic artery. His was on his MCA or I believe. Um, so his, you know, his recommendation was a straightforward, we're going to clip the aneurysm, you know, that'll be the simple lifelong treatment for him. Um, for me, just because it was riskier, you know, we sat down, we discussed it. Um, we thought the best first step for me was to do an angiogram. And I, you know, scheduled that angiogram, did the angiogram, no complications, no complaints. Um, and then after that, we decided the best step forward for me was to coil the aneurysm, uh, which we did very successfully as well. Um, and here I am, 18 months later, still following up, still getting used to um, this side of life. Um, you know, we just did the, Dr. Cerule, Yewan and I just did the aneurysm walk this past weekend. and. It's something that means the world to me now. Um, not that it didn't before, but being on both sides of it, seeing, you know, dealing with the patients and seeing the patients, but now being a patient myself is um, something that's just much more meaningful to me. Um, and I tell the patients all the time, any, any one of the patients that calls me and is like, you know, how are you, how, you know, I relate now more so with all the aneurysm patients. And I've had quite a few who, you know, tell me they're trying to convince their relatives to get screened um, and they won't do it. They're resistant. They're scared. They don't want to know. Um, and I tell every one of them, give them my phone number. I will, you know, tell them the importance of this. Um, that, you know, I never would have thought I would have been an aneurysm patient myself, but here I am. Um, I have, you know, tried to encourage many of my family members to get screened as much as possible. Few of them have, um, and thankfully have come back clear. Some are resistant for fear of the unknown. Katie, I love that you touch upon that, you know, last point, which is, you know, some, you know, it's a natural human instinct to be afraid. That's normal. And, you know, what you just said that some people would tell you, oh, I rather would not know. And I think that, you know, you've been through the process. And I think that, you know, considering how many tools we have nowadays that we could use to cure aneurysms, you know, not wanting to know is certainly the worst thing you could do because, you know, there are very good ways how we can treat aneurysms and we rather treat them when they are not ruptured, obviously. And I think in your case, it's so powerful because you not only you work with us, but you also leave aneurysms from both ends. You saw your mother, you know, with a ruptured aneurysm, and you saw yourself and your brother with unruptured ones. So, I mean, like, of course, life happens for a reason, and, you know, Sometimes it's it's impossible to go back on time, 
but you know it's in these times when you realize how much it would have been, how how good would it have been to know about the aneurysm in my mother's case so that she would have had the chance to have it treated just like you did or your yes. brother did so i think it's a very powerful you know thing to to say personally no i agree i mean my mom was one of 12 and out of those 12 seven of them have passed away um right. And it was all, you know, every one of them, it was, oh, it's cardiac related, it's cardiac related. But now I really wonder, you know, was it actually cardiac related or was it aneurysms that we didn't know all of these siblings possibly had? So right. it's, yeah, it's one of those things where it's good not to know, but it's better to know. Yeah, and I just want to put out some data there and I'm going to go through some questions and then we can go back to both you, one and you, but one important data to keep in mind, which is always a challenge for us, you know, who are dealing with aneurysm patients, is that when you see an, an aneurysm, we know that generally speaking, they rupture at a 2% per year rate, meaning over the if I if we found that you have an aneurysm, the risk of rupture is going to be 2% in the next year, but over the next 10 years, 20%. So yes, majority will not rupture, but unfortunately we don't have a crystal ball to know which ones will and which ones won't. So, you know, that's why it becomes quite a challenge in our field because there's so much at a state that you really don't wanna miss on a patient that you could cure before the aneurysm ruptures. Um, there are a couple of questions. One question is, I'm having a hard time deciphering percentages and statistics when it comes to deciding treatment for a small aneurysm, less than three millimeters. I understand rupture rates for this size, but another way I'd like to ask this question that might help me understand, in your experience, what amount of a small aneurysms never require treatment? What amount never change throughout a patient's life and they die with them? That's a great question. And the challenge of this question is, in fact, it is the topic of a lot of research in our field. The initial data that we gathered, so first of all, there are some factors that we take into account to determine whether an aneurysm is at risk for rupture. A big factor is size, but also shape, also location, and then patient factors like family history and so on. When it comes to size, if you look at the initial um, research that was done coming from Europe, the determination was that aneurysms that are less than five millimeters are very unlikely to rupture. Now, further trials done after that put that into question. And now we know that in clinical practice, in day-to-day -day life, we see that most of the aneurysms that we see ruptured are not very big. In fact, there are less than five, many of them. So what we have come to understand is that it, it's not only about the size, but about the shape. It's not the same thing, an aneurysm that is extremely regular in shape, round shape, as opposed to one that is highly irregular in shape, or even, even more than that, an aneurysm that has an area of weakness in the wall that unfortunately we could only see sometimes with actual angiography, going back to the angiogram. So to answer your question, yes, a lot of aneurysms sometimes we treat when they are below five millimeters, depending on their actual shape and the location where they are. Certain locations are more risky than or riskier than other ones, and certain shapes are worse than others. Um, so I hope that answered that question. There's another question on, on is there data connection between aneurysm and blood thinners? Um, no, I think that um, obviously if you have, or I don't know you want, if you wanted to comment something that on there, but you know, I was going to say, if you are, if you need to be on blood thinners because of a heart condition or some other condition, you know, you should continue to be on it. And the one thing we need to keep in mind though, is that if you do have a ruptured aneurysm, with, you know, and you are on blood thinners, the amount of bleeding could be a lot worse. Therefore, it may be one factor that we may take into account when we are determining between observation of the aneurysm versus treatment. 
anyone, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to add something to that. Yeah, I don't know if this question was more geared towards like, do does being on blood thinners increase your risk for aneurysm, which it doesn't. Um, they're not one, it's not a causation or effect kind of a relationship, but kind of like what Dr. Cerullo was mentioning, why are you on the blood thinner is the bigger question. You know, if you're on blood thinners because you have a you have a heart condition, if your heart, you know, arteries, your heart valves are not good. Um, you know, that kind of perks our, our, our interest and our caution a little bit more, because then, you know, if your heart's not doing so well, then, you know, if your heart's not pumping regularly, like AFib, for example, then that just increases your risk for stroke in general. So then we're a little bit more conscientious of, hey, let's, let's make sure that we all have all our stroke prevention medications and med medical therapies on board. Um, but that being said, not related in terms of being on blood thinners cause aneurysms. It's just another thing that we have to keep in mind. And that when we are, let's say, putting you on medications from an aneurysm standpoint, that we keep that in mind and we work with your cardiologist to make sure we're not, you know, making your blood too thin, but not letting it be thick either. So that's just something that we kind of work together and um, have a collaborative effort on managing. Great. And how often should you check after the procedure? Um, Yewan, you can also comment on that since you see a lot of our post-ops. Both, yeah. both, can you comment both post-angiogram and post-treatment you know, treatment of the aneurysm? Sure. So with our practice here at Lenox Hill, um, one thing that we like to do is any, usually for patients who get an angiogram, uh, I see them, you know, no matter what, within seven days. So let's say you get it done on a Wednesday. By next, by the following Wednesday, I either see you in office or um, virtually, just to make sure everything goes well or everything has gone well. You don't have any like you know hematoma or like that bruising in the groin site or the wrist that Doctor Cerulli mentioned is one of the um, you know possible side effects or risks. Um, and make sure, you know, if there's any other questions from the procedure, I address those. Um, you haven't had an, a reaction to the dye, for example, things like that. So that's just kind of like a, a brief kind of post-op uh, visit that the patient and I would have. Following that, um, about a week later or so, depending on the availability of the patient, the patient would come in, meet with Dr. Cerule and myself, review the results and um, come up with a treatment plan. So whether it's to watch it and have um, if there truly is an aneurysm, should we, you know, come back in a year and um, have you come back with an MRA or should you come back in three months or um, just whatever the case might be? It's, it's very much dependent on what the patient's aneurysm um, looks like, where it is. Again, it's all about size, location, family history. It's not just like a, it's not just like a formula. There's a lot of things that we take into account. So it can either be, hey, let's follow up with imaging or let's let's go ahead and move on with the procedure. But again, that all depends on what we find in the angiogram itself. Great, great. So I have another question in regards to angiogram. Is there a risk of a stroke in an angiogram? Is there a risk? Is, is that a potential outcome of an angiogram? Yes, it's a potential outcome. It would be extremely rare. And, you know, um, I mean, yes, has it happened historically and in the literature? Yes, but it would be a very, very rare, you know, thing to happen in angiogram. I just want to reemphasize angiogram is a diagnostic procedure. It's extremely safe. It's really a routine procedure. We put like a, a sort of like an IV line, you know, either in the wrist or in the groin, um, more and more, you know, we do it more in the wrist, but some patients for some reason sometimes prefer the leg. Um, but it's really just taking pictures. So the risks are really, really low. And I think the kind of information we're getting from them is, is so important that, you know, any benefits that we get out of it are way more, way more than the risks that it entails. Now, in patients who are very bad vasculopaths, meaning much older patients who have a lot of like, you know, heart or vascular problems, sometimes they become risky and we stay away from them. But those are the same patients that also we would stay away from treating an aneurysm just because the patients are too sick anyways to treat an aneurysm. So if we're not even considering treatment of the aneurysm, 
you know, because the patient has very bad vessels or very bad poor health condition, they're pro then most likely we're not doing an angiogram either. And maybe I want to circle back to Katie and maybe she can actually talk a little bit about her own experience on the angiogram. And she's had at least two by now. And maybe comment on the last one that you had about a year ago or six months when we did the first follow-up. I think we did it through the wrist. And you can tell us a little bit you know, how you felt during the angiogram when you went home, when you came back to work, how was it overall? So the angiogram is actually a very um, interesting experience um, because you do get put to sleep, but you're also awake. Um, I think the team had described it to me as like a twilight sort of zone experience. Um, but I do remember my first angiogram was in through the groin. Um, I didn't have any pain. You didn't feel anything. Um, but I did remember waking up a little bit, just enough to hear uh, my surgeon at the time speaking and just telling me like, okay, we're going to, you know, inject the contrast now. So your face is going to get very hot. Try not to move. Um, and I remember trying to peek over at the screen to see exactly what you guys were doing. Um, but yeah, that was, I think that was probably the extent of what I remember of my first angiogram. Um, the second one we did, we went in through the wrist, um, which I honestly prefer, um, just mostly for the eating portion of it because you get to eat sooner. Um, but Again, it was completely painless. Um, you know, I, I remember you speaking to me and, and again, same thing, telling me, you know, we're gonna inject the contrast now, stay still. Um, and then I remember, you know, just waking up to our team who was like, everything went well, um, you know, bandaging up the wrist and, you know, wheeling me over to the recovery room. Um, but it's, it's something that I don't think patients should be scared of. Um, you know, it's a procedure, but at the same time, it's one of those procedures that ultimately is very enlightening and life-changing, um, but it, it's not a procedure that I would be terrified to undergo again and actually will be undergoing again in a couple weeks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting experience, but it's nothing to be scared of. Good. That that's great. Um, you know, I've never had an angiogram myself, obviously, but I do many of them. But it, it's always good to to understand what you know patients are are going through, and 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 we understand. It's a, it's you know for, you know dealing with this and having seen so many patients by now, and. In, in every kind of patient, whether it's a very severely, you know, sick patient because the aneurysm ruptured already or a patient like you when you came who were, you know, just an, it was an incidental aneurysm, but, you know, obviously in, in very good, you know, health, um, we understand that whatever it is that the patient is going through a tough time, you're dealing with something that you know is, is life-changing and you know could be life or death. So it's that certainly always helpful to understand and put ourselves in, 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 in your shoes in a certain way. Um, there's one question that's here, very technical in a way. How could you treat a six millimeter aneurysm projecting superiorly from a proximal left middle cerebral artery with an early M2 branch originating from the lower dome of the aneurysm? Wouldn't my oxygen need to be cut off too long to treat it? Wow, this is um, as specific as it gets um, in terms of the, the description of the aneurysm. But what you are describing there is an aneurysm that most likely needs treatment just based on location in the MCA, based on the size of six millimeters. And, you know, without looking at the images myself, just following the description you are giving me, there are several good ways how we treat those aneurysms that are you know, fairly safe. Probably we could either, you know, do a clipping of the aneurysm, in which case, you know, you do, you have to, you know, open the head a little and put a clip, or you could do endovascular um, coiling or flow diversion of that aneurysm using an intrasacular device 
called a web device. So, you know, both of these procedures have pretty low risk overall when we do it electively, meaning well-planned. Probably the risk of the treatment of this aneurysm is going to be, you know, overall risk less than 2% chance that something, you know, bad could happen. So clearly, you know, based on the description that you that you gave, I think it's something that we would consider treatment. But again, we would need to be looking at the images. So if you want a second opinion or something, I'll be happy to, to see you, you know, in the office. Um, another question, do patients need any tests before angiogram to make sure that they're healthy enough to have angiogram? That's a great question, Yewan. You can take it there and answer. Yeah, so Dr. Stuhl and I work with a team um, here at Lenox Hill and within Northwell. Uh, it's called a clearance clinic, but then we also have a, a coordinator who helps with us too. So basically, before you get this angiogram or any kind of procedure with us, I would send you home with a packet. It's called a clearance packet. It's um, something that you would have to see your primary care for. And if you don't have one, we would, happy, we would be happy to set you up with one. But your primary care would have to sign off on it, make sure they evaluate you said, and say, yes, this, this patient is okay to undergo this angiogram. Now, um, you mentioned heart clots, et cetera. So in patients who I, you know, after reviewing the history with them, if, if they have a, a concerning heart condition or even like a lung condition, any kind of um, other issues within the body, then I would kind of review the history with you. And if you indeed have a concerning condition, I would have you see that specific provider, whether it be cardiologist, urologist, pulmonologist, and make sure that they are aware that you're undergoing this procedure um, and they are okay with it too. So that's a clearance, um, an additional clearance in addition to the primary care clearance that uh, would have to be done. But I would work with you. We would figure out which specialists uh, you, know, you need to see, if any, and we'll go from there. Yes, great, great. But yeah, we whenever we do an angiogram and we are going to start evaluating you for a potential treatment of an aneurysm, we want to make sure we have a full picture of your health so that we, we don't miss out on anything. We want to make sure that we understand, you know, what's your health condition, what how's your cholesterol, how's your how are your, you know, your your, your how's your coagulation, how's your how are your how's your lung, your heart. It's very important to have a complete picture of the patient's health. Um, going uh, with some more questions for individuals with identified aneurysms who do not drink, smoke, and with controlled blood pressure, healthy lifestyle, what would be the recommendations to best manage the identified aneurysms and prevent formation of other aneurysms if at all possible? Great question. You know, look, there are several things we could do to avoid having aneurysms. And these are the things that going back to what I spoke about in risk factors, you know, smoking, so not, don't smoke, um, no heavy alcohol, uh, control your blood pressure, try to have healthy, you know, diet, because healthy diet typically results into less cholesterol, which results in healthier vessels. So those are the really kind of things you could do, you know, understand as well that unfortunately, even if you do all those things, you know, um, sometimes genetics play a stronger role. So even if I don't smoke, even if I do everything I can, there is a risk that I'm going to have an aneurysm uh, for the reasons that we spoke about at the beginning, because some of genetic factors, like, you know, collagen is a big part of the vessel wall. The way the cells are together in the vessel are a big factor. And there are so many genes that we still don't understand, given our, the scientific evidence that we have nowadays, that minute genes that may just be related to the way cells get together in the blood vessel, if they are not, you know, as good in in one, you know, family, they may result in increased risk for aneurysm. So in, in summary, try to live a healthy lifestyle, understanding that sometimes, despite that, you may still have aneurysms. And I think that's really related to the next question, which is, is there anything that we can do to strengthen our blood vessels throughout our body to ward off future aneurysms? I think the answer is very similar. I think, yes, there are things you could do, which is have a healthy life. Don't smoke, no heavy alcohol, eat well, exercise. 
And these are the kind of things that you could that we could all do, in fact, to 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 try to prevent, you know, having aneurysms. Um, there's a really interesting question uh, about do some people experience some memory problems after aneurysm surgery? That's a great question. The answer is, you know, it's a little complex. There are some surgeries in particular that we know there's evidence that there is there could potentially be some neuropsychological impact, especially when we a specific aneurysm that is in the anterior communicating artery. When you do surgical clipping of some of them, the location of that surgical clip, because of its relation to some brain structures, can potentially result in some, you know, neuropsychological problems or some memory problems. That is one reason why many times we stay away from putting the clip there and we go endovascular. Now, it gets a little interesting because taken together, even if you go endovascular, we know that aneurysm patients could potentially have some, you know, overall neuropsychological problems, including some anxiety, some stuff. And I think there's no science behind it in those cases. But I could only imagine that there's a psychogenic problem with the anxiety that we have lived through having a balloon in our brain that, you know, we tend to be fearful of. So, you know, no scientific data on it, but I can only imagine anecdotally that, you know, it may pose quite a challenge. And, you know, we have a comprehensive team. We sometimes refer our patients to neuropsychology testing and so on, because I think sometimes that helps. But, you know, long story short, in some specific cases, there may be in, in the general population, there shouldn't be. But, you know, we are sensitive to the fact that there's some big psychological impact sometimes when we treat mm -hmm. aneurysms. And also with angio, this is, this is apart from angiograms. Angiograms don't cause memory issues. But like we were saying, if we were to treat it, if we, if we were to treat your aneurysm with clipping pending or depending on where the location of that, you know, stent or clip is, it could, in theory, um, that being one piece. And then the second piece is, you know, anything that's dealing with the brain, it can cause people anxiety. So the anxiety component can kind of contribute or add to an already existing memory problem or even um, kind of contribute to formation of an, a memory problem. But that's not specific to angiograms or treatments of aneur angiograms or treatments of aneurysms themselves. So just to clarify, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a very lovely comment from Ms. Becerra here. Not a question, but a comment. The experience I had with my angiogram was great from beginning to end. The nurse and the staff, not to mention Dr. Cerulli, were amazing. I thought I was in great hands. I all went well. I strongly recommend that Lenox Hill has the best team. Well, thank you very much for the Thank compliment. you. We love to hear it. That's why we do what we do to take care of you and take care of patients. I see two more questions. What would be the best imaging to identify kidney aneurysms? I'm not a kidney expert, but I will tell you that probably a CT angiogram of the abdomen would certainly help to identify a kidney aneurysm and probably see a kidney doctor would help as well. But I think that should help. If I need, um, actually, Yuan, why don't you take the next question and answer it yourself? Yeah. Um, so for Allah, um, you can reach out to, and I'll, I'll type this out because there's, there's a lot of numbers, uh, involved, but you can just call our office. It's, um, our main line, it's the 3900 number. And, um, you can give us a call, say, Hey, I would like to see Dr. Cerule. Um, and if you have any imaging, uh, that you, like that you got somewhere else, um, just please bring that with you. If you don't, you can schedule an appointment with me. Um, we'll do a kind of like an intro appointment together and I'll order any kind of imaging that you need. And then we'll see Dr. Cerulli together and um, see what we need to do from there. So I'll give you the phone number and our emails here. Okay. Yeah. And, and look, sometimes, you know, it's super important to review images, especially if you have an MRA or we always start with either an MRA or CTA. And then look, many times we don't need an angiogram and we have enough details on the MRA that we could take at least the decision to observe based on it or to understand whether it's something dangerous or not. So 
you know, we'll, we're always very cautious about, you know, um, interpreting these MRAs. And actually, Katie mentioned something important. I think in, in her brother's case, for example, the radiologist did not, you know, catch the aneurysm, but it was Dr. Langer who did it. Um, so sometimes, you know, the radiologist may think it's an aneurysm, but when we review it, because we see hundreds of these scans every week, we may say, well, look, this is not an aneurysm. There's no need to do anything. Um, and the opposite. Sometimes when when the radiologist interprets uh, uh, interprets the androgram as something, we think it's something else. So it's very important to review some images. So I think we're getting towards the end. Um, Katie, if you want to have some closing remarks or you want. Katie, I think you're muted. Yep. Um no, I think my my closing remarks would uh, would really be just if you know there's a family history or you have any questions, you know, really push your um, your physician to get screened. Um, you know, honestly, without the team here, I probably would have never been screened myself. So, um, you know, I have really become a champion, you know, for my family of just the importance of screening and getting tested. And if that question mark is there, then you know what? It can't hurt to be tested and just be sure because I I lived with the anxiety of it, you know, for uh, I think a month between when I got diagnosed and when I was treated. And it it's the anxiety is tough, you know, thinking I have a ticking time bomb in my head and, you know, going on every day with that thought in your mind is just it can somewhat be crippling so you know i i champion patients to get tested get screened be sure and you know and then you can move on from there and take it from there yeah yeah thanks katie that's so um encouraging and empowering and Dr. Surly, Katie, and I, we do this not to scare anyone. Um, we just want to empower you with all the information because knowledge is power. Um, you know, for me too, personally, like I've, now that I am, you know, in neurovascular and, you know, there's been Instagrams about me being in neurovascular surgery, people come to me and say like, oh my gosh, I've had this family member, that family member, um, what should I do? Should I get tested? Should I get an MRA? And it's knowledge is power. Um, so we always encourage patients, you know, if you have a family history, um, just get an MRA or get some kind of imaging to check it out. If you need treatment or you need an angiogram, we're more than happy to see you. If you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. Um, our information is uh, listed in the um, emails that were sent out and I've answered them and or I've put it in kind of the chat. I'll put it in again. Um, but yeah, we're always here for you. Let us know if you have any questions. If you want to come see us, we'd be happy to see you. Um, thanks all for joining. All right. Let me close by answering one question. I think I have a Dr. Langer's patient here. <laughs> I have a 9.6 millimeter aneurysm, so just clipping. Um, well, let me clarify the brain and the memory loss. These are very, very unique cases, um, very rare that it happens. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that as a group, when we look at aneurysms, we discuss specific cases, but I will tell you, Doreen, that with the 9.6 millimeter aneurysm, that is at very high risk for rupture. So I think, you know, again, without seeing the images, but, but trusting, um, you know, that the measures are right based on what you're saying, assuming that it's true, it's an aneurysm that you should definitely get treated because the risks for an almost one centimeter aneurysm, you know, the risk for rupture is, is pretty high. So I think you need to prioritize treatment in this case. And I think that um, that's the way to go there. So I think we covered it all. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for participating. We're so happy, you know, to answer these questions. And I hope that you leave the webinar feeling, you know, that you understand a little better aneurysms and that you have, you know, your questions answered and that you feel better about understanding this condition. And again, if you do have further questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help out in whatever we can. And Hannah is back. <laughs>
Yes, I am back. Um, what would uh, Dr. Cerule, what's the best way to reach out to you? Would it be? Yeah, so I put in the um, chat box, my email, and then the number to the main line. So we've had a couple of people ask about how to reach us or make appointments. So calling that main line is, would be great. Um, if you have any like specific concerns or would like to see, um, you know, you would like to ask me anything too, um, Dr. Cerule and my information is email is in the chat as well. Yeah, and I'm putting my email too. Yes, why Cerule? Oh, here, yes, I'll, I'll make it out to everyone. No, I did it, I did it. Okay. Yeah, but just to see your one if you email me. Yes, please see, <laughs> see me because... Uh, <laughs> I will check it. I check it um, obsessively. So, yeah. All right. Great. Great. Great uh, webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.